Hello and welcome to episode 75 of the Rollo and Slappy Show. Today is January 22nd, 2018. I am Rollo McFlugel and with me is Slappy Jones 2 and we are both of McFlugel.com. The show notes page for this episode is McFlugel.com slash 75 where you'll be able to find links to things we talk about in this episode as well as ways to subscribe to our podcast and catch us on social media. So with that, I'm going to hand it right over to Slappy, and he's going to introduce our episode topic. Yeah, thank you, Rallo, and thank you, everyone, for listening. <clears throat> Excuse me today. I am um, feeling a little under the weather. <clears throat> Got some of the stomach bug that's going around these parts. Uh, so if I do disappear, I'll be right back, I promise. Um, and pardon my voice. It sounds worse than usual. And, uh, and no amount of audio magic. <laughs> Yeah, he's got his soundboard out, and he's trying to. We've been working for about twenty minutes trying to get it to sound okay, and we just can't, can't get there. Yeah. Uh, so, today's topic: we are going to dig up an article that was a couple of years ago, written by Matt Zwolinski. This was a. Um, <clears throat> this was going around libertarian circles back when it was first written, and it resurfaces its head every now and again. And we haven't covered a universal basic income. Yet, so that's what we're going to do today. Uh, the article is titled The Libertarian Case for a Basic Income. It was on Cato. Um, it was it on their website or was it on their little libertarianism.org website? Yep, it was on that one. <clears throat> yeah. And so Matt Zolinski um, is a libertarian, um, claims to be, and he is in favor of a universal basic income, which is essentially. The government just gets rid of all the current welfare we have and writes a check to every single person uh, in the country, regardless of how much money they make, regardless of whether they're working or not. It's just kind of a basic income to meet your, I guess, designed to meet your basic needs so that you can free up time to do other things or just not have to worry that if you show up in the uh, – show up to work and the doors are dead bolted, you're not going to be out on the streets because you have this universal basic income to help paying your bills, help continue paying your bills. And so, Rallo, let's get into it. I'm going to kind of, we're not going to read through the entire article, but I will point out or I will highlight his three points starting with number one, then we'll discuss it and move on to the next. So number one, a basic income guarantee would be much better than the current welfare state. Uh, Rallo? Well, one thing I, I want to say, um, just to be fair to Zwolinski, is that he's not necess he's not saying that um, if he had his way, libertarian world, that he would have a, a basic income. That's it's, correct. I'm sorry if I misrepresented that. When yeah. I say he's in favor of it, it would be given the system we have. Right. So w one thing I want to say is he makes the point because he brings up – in the beginning of the article about there's a Swiss proposal where they guarantee what's the equivalent of 2,800 uh, U.S. dollars a month um, for, I guess it's, no, yeah, it's every citizen. For, yeah, yeah, every citizen. Person. And he says, you know, that's, that's a lot, even for Swiss standards. And the problem is that they don't eliminate everything else. And that's what he's advocating for, is if we do away with the current welfare system, you can... You know, get rid of a lot of the bloated uh, bureaucracy that we currently have and also can get rid of some of the nanny state stuff because then, you know, if you just have a write a check to people and say, hey, do whatever you want with it, you don't have the government directing, directing people's yeah, lives. Yeah, like crony capitalism kind of. Right. So that's all well and good, but I don't think that's practical at all because – you know, he as he's already saying, the Swiss aren't eliminating their welfare system. They're doing it um, in addition to what they already have. So it's tough to ever have the state kind of roll back anything. They do it on occasion, but especially with something like a huge bureaucracy, something that right. creates a lot of government jobs, a lot of government employment, a lot of government power— they're not just going to give that up. I mean, and even just think about it, even if there was a president who really wanted to, say, remove the Department of Education, <clears throat> how many people do you think are employed by the Department of Education? You know, and so even though it would be 
great to get rid of the Department of Education. That politician or that politician's party needs to run for election. And you can just see it all over the news. Doesn't care about kids, cut all these jobs, 100,000 people out of work because President so-and-so cut the Department of Education. Um, I don't know how many people are employed by the Department of Education, but um, whatever department it is, it's not going to be an easy political move to cut anything. Right. So, and that just brings me to a greater point, I think is... As libertarians, we should be abolitionists and saying that we should just be getting rid of all of that stuff and not trying to replace it with anything because that's really the the, the problem isn't this a certain uh, system that's in place. The problem is that there's a state apparatus that's kind of directing people and resources. So, you know, I understand. I, I don't. I don't doubt for a second Zelensky's um, what what he's trying to do. I I trust that he has good intentions, but so does basically most other people, people that support all of the current welfare state or or whatever else. All all the typical voters out there, all the typical Democrats and Republicans. I don't think they're evil people who want terrible things to happen to others, and that they're imposing their policies to make people poor. I think everyone generally has good intentions, but it's the problem of central planning. It's the problem of socialism. It's the problem of the economic so, calculation problem. It's doomed. I, I, you know, I don't care if you have the most libertarian of politicians in there. If you institute a basic income guarantee, it's doomed to failure for the same reason that every government solution is doomed to failure. And I know that seems like it's just, uh, you know, and. An, uh, an easy out for you know someone who would be considered a libertarian purist but that's that's the na- that's the basis for every libertarian argument against the state is not that we just hate the state we don't want to exist we just, no it doesn't work it's not a solution to to our problems well don't you think you need to be a little more pragmatic I and i mean that not sarcastically I no mean no i yeah. think i i think it's I think that is pragmatic to acknowledge that instead of saying that, no, it's it's a false uh, pragmatism to say that we can try to use the state efficiently if we just did it our way. You're fighting. It's it's not. In, there's I, I don't I don't see there's any way of eliminating all that bureaucracy. Right. And that's my my biggest take on this. Is that it's just if you want to talk about being pragmatic, it is absolutely not pragmatic to cut all that bureaucracy. It just won't happen. Right. And 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 so never will. Right. And I I, so I think that if you're going to try to cut the government down, I I think you just cut it. (laughs) Cut it wherever you can. You know, you we have welfare systems in place. We have things like food stamps. So I think it's I think you're better off undoing restrictions on what you can spend welfare the current welfare on as opposed to undoing the restrictions and then just creating this whole other system just just eat away at the government's power right so i don't know i don't, I don't want to beat because it, it, a lot of the arguments we're going to have are going to kind of carry over into each of his points so you want to go to the next one unless you had something more you want to yeah no we can we can move on okay um a basic income guarantee might be required on libertarian grounds as reparation for past injustice. So, yeah, I mean, what he's saying here is that, um, you know, libertarianism sounds great if we could just hit a reset button and start over again. And then everyone could go out and um, homestead land and goods and uh, we could create a libertarian society that's fair. But that's not the way history went. There's been a lot of conquests. There's been stolen land. And even a libertarian would say, if you can show that, you know, this thing was yours or your family's, you should get it. Um, Therefore, one way to create reparations, because if we did go to a straight libertarian society, well, the people at the top are going to start out at the top and they're there because they stole, I guess, 
And uh, the people on the bottom are there because they're unfortunate situation from the previous system of, of plunder. Um, uh, so this could be a way of reparations, give everyone a basic income. And, uh, that kind of makes up for the sins of the past. Yeah. So how do you, you're still stealing from people though. <clears throat> well, is it stealing if you stole it? I mean, I don't think I stole anything. I, I know I'm sure I've had some advantages from ill-gotten gains from something, but I've also had a lot stolen from me. And it's right. not. Uh, and and I didn't do. I if someone wants to prove that I directly stole from someone and and wants me to pay reparations to them um, for restitution, then absolutely. But you know, it's the state doing these things. And so every, and most people, it's not like most people are libertarian. And this may be a weak argument because just because you're not a libertarian doesn't mean you don't have certain rights. But I mean, most people are cool with the game that's being played. Yeah. So it's, it's just, it, I don't know. It just doesn't seem workable to say, all right, well, theft happened in the past and it was wrong. Okay. We can agree with that. So let's, let's steal some more from people. Right. And I, I also like wonder, I mean, how much are you responsible for what your father did and his father? I don't think I'm really responsible at all. I had nothing to do with anything my dad's done. Right. I, I mean, very little. Maybe if he went to a basketball game when I was eight, I had something to do with that. But, you know, if my grandparents or great grandparents or great great grandparents, did something to someone at that time, how would that be on me? Now, with the land argument, which I think he made, I read this earlier, so I, I apologize. The, the land was stolen, as you know, is what I think they're arguing. And plus, you know, slavery, which is kind of bad. Um, so reparations for that and reparations from stealing land and the colonialism and all that stuff that went on. Um, but if say the land I'm living on right now, rightfully belong to whatever Indian tribe was in this area and they could prove it, well, they have a claim to this piece of land, but they certainly, I mean, you can't just say, well, someone stole it. So I'm taking this. Right. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, no, I think that's, that's perfectly valid what you're saying. Right. So how would it make sense? Because first of all, my ancestors weren't in this country uh, during slavery. So, you know, whatever, why, why would I owe for slavery? They can't, they came over here and now I could be living on stolen land. Um, I mean, potentially like the example I just gave, but to put a whole group and there's a lot of immigrants in the last 50 years um, had nothing to do with certain things and individuals who've had nothing to do with anything. And that's when, it, you know, where I'm going is I, I don't have that collectivist mentality. Yeah. Where it's blacks versus whites versus Mexicans and the black group gets to do this to the white group and the white group gets to do this to the Mexican group. We see people as individuals. And if you as an individual didn't do anything, then What's the problem? Yeah, and, and so to quote from his article, he says, quote, those from the least well-off, or, uh, okay, assuming, quote, those from the least well-off group in the society have the highest probabilities of being the descendants of victims of the most serious injustice who are owed compensation by those who benefited from the injustices, assumed to be those better off, though sometimes the perpetrators will be others in the worst-off group then a rough rule of thumb for rectifying injustices might seem to be the following. Organize society so as to maximize the position of whatever group ends up least well off in the society. Um, I think you touched on that with saying that you don't, you shouldn't be responsible for the, the quote unquote sins of, of your father. Yeah. But also there's been a lot of uh, welfare positive people in society. In other words, people who have, received the stolen goods 
that are much worse off certainly than those who have a lot taken from them so i don't think his assumption is even that good that you can just say oh people who have the most stolen from them have been um so are the ones actually, that are worse are the worst worst off now it doesn't say that, that it's all you know anyone's fault because while the government has all these welfare programs and and every poverty fighting programs and everything that that's that's the only thing happening to them there's a lot of other stuff but the point is it's such a hodgepodge of stuff mm -hmm. okay so you've got a poor community and they get a lot of welfare and they get all this uh you know free stuff from the government they're not really paying much in taxes okay but there's also licensing laws there's also the war on drugs there's also all sorts of other laws that are that point. are that are really harming them so it's not even yeah. necessarily that they're getting stuff taken away from them it's the state is just violating their their other basic rights of yeah. being able to do with what proper do what they want with the property that they have yep. so one how in the world are you going to figure out who's had what taken from them and who's gotten stuff given to them and then two, um, y you know, I, I don't even know what the, the second point was. I was just saying. <laughs> that was the second point, and it was pretty good. Yeah. That point. That, um, you know, everyone. Well, how would everyone, you figure it out? How would you do it? I mean, where yeah, are you going? Yeah. yeah. It, it, it's, you know. it's, it's not that cut and dry what he's kind of assuming, assuming it to be. Um, so I think also why, why does just money make it better? Right. It, it, yeah, it certainly doesn't. I mean, I think you, like I said, all the licensing laws, the war on drugs, uh -huh. all these things that prevent people from using the property they have as they see fit is probably the greater harm to certainly. society than getting some of your money stolen. Not to downplay that because that is not being able to do with it. it all ties into each other but again well, if you want to look at who's getting the most stolen from them if we're talking money i mean who pays the most taxes right so that kind of hurts his argument a bit yeah so i think he was i think I mean, he, he thinking, yeah i know i know where he's going i think but yeah it's it was a little i guess a little sloppy yeah um all right number three the basic income guarantee might be required to meet the basic needs of the poor. So this one, um, this is where I was going to bring up the point you just made, that if you want to meet the basic needs of the poor, let them do what they want with their property. Let them create, make it easy to create a business. Get rid of licensing laws. Um, get rid of zoning laws. Let them start a business and let them earn money. Otherwise, they resort to the to selling drugs because that's the one industry they can get into right yeah it's th this one kind of hurts a little bit as a libertarian seeing another libertarian saying that the state is a solution to meeting the basic needs of people and i know he's kind of framing that in the situation that we have today that the state exists right. but still Despite the state existing, it still is not a good source of a solution to fight any sort of problem. I mean, what's the point of being a libertarian if you're going to argue that the state is a better solution, regardless of of how big the state is? Right. It's never the solution. It's always the problem. And if you fight the state with, with just with just changing the program i mean you're not you're not you're not hitting the root cause of the problem um so i think it's i i can't buy i can't buy that or um this argument to say that it's required i mean i mean ugh. I know it's it's more nuanced than just his 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 arguments are more nuanced, and I recommend if you're not familiar with the article to read to read his article so you can see what he's actually saying. But um, you know, I don't I don't think he makes drives his point very well. Other than just kind of saying, well, we kind of need it. 
and he just relies on Fried, uh, Milton Friedman and, and Frederick Milton Hayek, Friedman, Hayek. Yeah. Um, saying, well, they argue for it, so that's kind of what what I need for yeah, it. Yeah, like, don't be scared to support it, because these guys did. Right. Well, we can you know, name 50 other libertarian philosophers who said the opposite, so. Right. It's, it's kind of uh, just an appeal to authority. Question for you that I didn't um, talk about before the show, but were, was there countries talking about the, I know you talked about Switzerland, but were there other countries talking about doing it or doing a universal basic income? I think so. It pops up every once in a while. Um, I don't know how much in the U.S. it's it's gotten any serious consideration. And it's funny because the, the people I hear it from the most, and this is probably just by the nature of who I talk to about this kind of stuff, is from is from some libertarian types. Yeah. And it's just as a way to try to, I mean, it's well intentioned because they're trying to do away with, they're trying to shrink the government, but I just think it's a, it's a wrong headed approach. I mean, if you're going to do any sorts of basic guarantees, I would say maybe just have a tractor base, basic tractor guarantee. Tractor, tractor based economy. Yeah. Because that is the best store of value. Like I said, last yeah. episode. Right. Okay. That's interesting. I'll have to look into that. Yeah. Um, and in the end of this, uh, well, yeah, in the end, he, he kind of goes through three, uh, objections to, uh, basic income guarantees, like disincentives for work effects on migration and effects on, uh, economic growth. Um, so if you're interested in, uh, he, he kind of responds to each of them and then I want to go, I think we've, you're, you're sick tonight, so I don't want to keep you yeah. on forever. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, know, I don't know where he goes with his objections, but it's clearly a disincentive for work. I mean, I'd like to see. Well, I mean, what's he, what's he talking about? If someone gave me a check for what I'm earning at work, or oh, here's an example: I do drive for Uber occasionally. If someone gave me a check for the amount of money I make at Uber. I probably would drive a lot less for Uber. Yeah. Well, he kind of says this. Um, I just lost my spot. Uh, so, and so that in the way, the disincentives to employment, it creates, oh, sorry. Oh, well, he's just saying that um, it's just a basic income guarantee. So you don't, if you take a job, uh, you're not losing any money. Well, is he just, saying it's just, just dollar for dollar money. offset? Well, no, he's just saying that, um, so after all, with a basic income guarantee, the money you get is yours to keep. You don't lose it if you take uh, a job and start earning money. Well, it does disincentivize work. It does, and it, it, it disincentivize productive work. Right. I mean, if you, you know, if I was in college and you were giving me, what were they talking about? Twenty five hundred dollars a month. Twenty eight hundred in Switzerland, and I have no idea what his proposal would be. Okay, well, whatever it is. I mean, I th when I was in college, I didn't get much at all. Right. Um, and you know, if you gave me a decent enough check, or you know, I don't know, if it if if by getting a universal basic income. It allows you to continue operating the pizza shop that nobody goes to, so you're losing money. That's bad for the economy. Right. And you should not be encouraged to do things that are failing because they should fail. There's a reason. There's a signal there. Your product is not wanted. Exactly. He also so, says with a negative income tax, the disincentives are there, but arguably at an acceptable level. After all, under an NIT or negative income tax, if you are unemployed and then you get a job, you're going to have more money as a result. You won't keep all of the money, but no one keeps all of the money they earn from their job. A large chunk of it goes to taxes. It's the same idea here, except in reverse, hence the label of negative income tax. So it's at a Zwolinski acceptable level. So, oh, that's good. Yeah. So, I mean, as long as he considers... Yeah, it's acceptable. acceptable to him. Yeah. Stop being so pure. True. So, um, 
I don't know. I, I mean, the effects on immigration, I think it's the same kind of welfare thing that people of closed borders talk about. And it's, again, I don't blame the, uh, blame the immigrant for the sins of the state. Um, so, I don't know. Do you have yeah. anything else you want to say about this? I got nothing. Okay. I gotta, I gotta get to bed, get my soup and some Gatorade and yeah, chicken, yeah. Campbell's chicken noodle soup, yes. Dayquil, and Sprite. Yes, indeed. So I'll do a quick, unless you have a free market success story. No, go ahead. So we're talking about this last week, and uh, it's the middle, towards the end of January, so kind of the dead of winter up here. And I went to the supermarket the other day and bought bananas. So uh, not only are they out of season in this hemisphere, but... They also don't even grow in southeastern Pennsylvania. So it's kind of nice to be able to get fresh fruit and vegetables from, you don't have to, you know, it doesn't have to be in season. It doesn't have to be local for you to get it. And it's pretty cheap. I mean, I think bananas are something like 70 cents a pound or something, typically. Mm. Um, so that's not bad at all. And so uh, it's just a little... Uh, transportation refrigeration maybe a little bit of yellow spray paint yeah. things that the market provi <laughs> provide yeah. to uh get get some uh some things we come to expect in life it's it's pretty amazing that we can expect to get bananas or other fruit from mm. tropical places aren't i you know i love citrus i love grapefruits and oranges and i can get them uh any time of the year thanks to speculators i know thanks to those dirty rotten speculators yeah, who buy up crops when they're in season to sell them when they're out of season. What a bunch of jerks. They are. So, with that, check out the show notes page at mcflugel.com slash 75, or you'll find links to this article by Matt Swalinski there. We'll have that link there. As well as an article I wrote about, uh, I think it was in 2014, arguing against a uh, alternate.org or whatever website that is article about universal basic income i rebutted it and you'll also find links to subscribe to this podcast on itunes and stitcher as well as subscribing to our email newsletter and finding us in social media we're up on twitter and facebook and a couple other places so check it out mcflugel.com slash 75 so thanks for listening and we will catch you next week peace